do two tests that we perform in the rotational chair, and that's sinusoidal harmonic acceleration testing, or SHA, as well as velocity step testing. There's a lot of other tests that we can perform in the chair, but we're just not going to have time to kind of talk about those today. Now, rotational testing at, at its basic foundations assesses the VOR, which we're all familiar with. But what I want to stress to you in this video here, as you, as you watch me turn my head back and forth, is that the VOR is both frequency and direction dependent. That is, as I turn my head to the right, you'll see I generate a right VOR. As I move my head to the left, I'll generate a leftward VOR, or leftward nystagmus. But it's also frequency dependent. That is, as I move my head faster, I generate a faster nystagmus VOR. As I move my head slower, I generate a slower nystagmus VOR. So the VOR is, is, is essentially commensurate with head rotation. The faster I go, the faster the nystagmus. And this is all based on the cupular displacement model, such that as I move my head slowly, I get minimal displacement of the cupula and thus minimal afferent drive to produce the VOR. As I move my head more briskly back and forth, I get greater cupular displacement, and therefore I get a more afferent drive and a more efficient VOR production. So as we rotate in the chair back and forth during our classic test of sinusoidal harmonic acceleration, one of the frequencies that we test at is we're evaluating how someone's VOR is being produced to various frequencies. As you see here, during leftward rotation, you generate a left VOR, and then during rightward rotate, rotation, you'll generate a right VOR. And that's plotted here in the slow phase component that we're most interested in during SHA testing. That is, during leftward chair rotation, you generate a right slow phase response. During leftward chair rotation, you generate a rightward slow phase response, which is the vestibular response that we're most interested in. Now, during this testing, you'll generate a opposing sinusoid of the VORI response in relation to the chair response that can be analytically or objectively described. We use three parameters to, to describe this, and that is VOR gain, phase, and symmetry. First, we're going to talk about gain, which is essentially the ratio of the peak eye response, how robust the eye moves, in relation to the head velocity response. And this is, this is seen as a comparison of the right VOR components and the left VOR components in relation to the velocity of the chair movement. So all we're really doing is looking at what is the intensity of the VOR in relation to the intensity of the chair. And that's going to produce a VOR gain response. And as you can see here, the I response in relation to the overall chair response or chair stimulus uh, produces a VOR gain that's approximately 50% or 46. Uh, now, the VOR is never going to be perfect. Um, the VOR only becomes really perfect at daily life activities, at, at frequencies of, uh, that, that, that somewhat extend beyond the chair. Um, but you can see that we can compare our responses against normal limits that are either produced within each person's clinic or, or by the manufacturer themselves. But gain in of itself is a good measure but it's high reliant upon patient interaction. So tasking is important, um, and, and you can get somewhat of a suppressive response from patients if they're not appropriately tasked. And the only thing I will, that I'll caution you to is that, is that recall that, that, that gain is the measure by which we, we compute phase and symmetry, which we'll get into a little bit. But it's important to task your patients in order to get the most robust gain possible that their, that their uh, vestibular labyrinths are able to produce. Uh, some common questions that I often get is there's a difference between low gain and really low gain. 
And this question is probably best answered by uh, a study that Baylow and his colleagues did way back in 1984, but was republished using some, um, s s some uh, clarity of, of means and standard deviations in 2011. And what you can see here in the gain plot on, on top is that healthy controls produce that almost 50% gain that we were seeing in our example just now, but for unilateral and bilateral patients, they produce a equivalent loss of, of maybe 50% gain each time you lose one ear. So both, both uh, bilateral vestibulopathies will, will produce VOR uh, response gains that are, that are actually quite low. Uh, and then if you lose one or unilateral loss, you lose about 50% of your system. Um, so those gain values are appear here. Now what the chair doesn't necessarily do a very strong job at is assessing enduring SHA uh, um, uh, objective measures is telling you the laterality of the lesion. We'll talk about that when we get into velocity step testing, but what you can see here is a fairly low gain response in relation to the overall chair velocity and that produces about a 20% gain here. But what it doesn't tell us, is this coming from the right ear, is this coming from the left ear? But there is gain. So I would say that this is low gain, but it's not really low gain. Really low gain is something like this, where you would have almost zero VOR response in response to the chair rotations to the right and to the left. And you can see that here, where, where there's actually no generated VOR nystagmus at any point in time. Uh, to chair rotations. But this, this pattern is actually not very common. The more common pattern that you'll see in a bilateral uh, vestibulopathy is a really low reduction in the lower frequencies that often commonly re returns to within the normal limits. Um, vestibular pathologies almost always impact lower frequencies first, somewhat opposite that of presbycusis. Um, and um, although a definitive bilateral vestibulopathy can't be confirmed here until we do other studies of VEMP and, and VHIT and things of that nature, um, this is a fairly common pattern for a bilateral VOR reduced response. Um, it is certainly not the very low f uh, gain response that we just saw, but nevertheless, um, it's almost always associated with these low frequency losses in, in uh, gain response for a bilateral response. Um, the other, uh, uh, let's talk about symmetry. We're going to skip over phase now because it's a little, a little bit more complicated. But symmetry is fairly simple. It's, it's asking the question about the leftward VOR compared to the rightward VOR in response to chair rotation. So it's essentially just a comparison of how is our right VOR compared to our left VOR, and we do that by by adding up the right VORs and the left VORs and then comparing them to get a symmetry response. This is fairly straightforward. Um, what you need to caution yourself though for with respect to um, symmetries is the fact that symmetries is not necessarily reflective of a laterality of lesion. It's not definitive indication of a right or a left weak response. Symmetry in, a, in, in chair is, is much comparable or analogous to directional preponderance that we're common, that we're, that we're fond of in caloric irrigations. It represents how well the system beats to the right versus how well the system beats to the left. Chair asymmetries, much like directional preponderances in calorics, are often the secondary result of spontaneous nystagmus, which under lethal is usually a unilateral lesion. So you need, to, um, you need to sort these things out, but recognize the fact that the rotational test isn't a static test. So any compensated static lesion may actually be uh, brought out during rotational testing because it's not a static test. So you need to keep that in, in, in mind. So lastly, let's talk about phase angle. And phase angle is a, um, is a more complicated measure. And what it refers to is the timing response between the eye response or the peak VOR relation to the peak head response or the peak chair response. And this timing or this temporal relationship is used to describe the overall phase of the vestibular system. Now, for, for higher frequencies, that, that VOR response is fairly well timed to the head response in so much that it produces a phase of zero or 
it's completely in phase with the stimulus. But for lower frequencies, you can see here that the VOR is not necessarily well-timed or well-tuned to head response. In fact, the VOR often leads that of the peak chair response, and we expect this. This is, a, this is something that we do absolutely expect when we test somebody for um, sinusoidal um, rotations. Um, this is only probably uh, something that we see generally for lower frequencies below, let's say, 0.04 hertz. 0.04 hertz, hertz is fairly well timed, but certainly for 0.02 and 0.01 hertz, there is definitely a phase disparity between eye response and, and head response. Why is this? Well, it, it's like that for low frequencies, and I'm going to come back to the idea that we talked about with the cupular displacement model. Remember the low frequencies of chair rotation are so weak that it only displaces the cupula a minimal amount. And as such, it, it, it produces an afferent drive that's pretty weak. And shall I say almost that it's so weak that it's somewhat inefficient to drive the VOR as such. Our central system recognizes this, and our central brainstem and cerebellum and, and something called the neural integrator produces a battery-like storage response that we refer to as the velocity storage system, but it generates this centrally augmented neural response that helps to drive the VOR for these really weak low frequency stimuli that produce such small cupular displacement that's pretty much inefficient to drive the VOR. So we really tap into this neural integrator, this velocity storage system for this lower frequencies. And as such, it does, it, this is a compensated kind of res, neural response that produces not so much of a great timed response between eye response output versus head output. But as, we were pro as, we're, as our head approaches faster frequencies, we're, we're much better timed between the ocular output, the VOR, and the, and the head output. Um, so we generally only see this for lower frequencies. Uh, and that's predominantly generated through the velocity storage system, which we'll see again when we talk about velocity step testing. Now, this is almost always a consequence of a lateral uh, of the unilateral peripheral vestibulopathy. Uh, and as we lose half, let's just say 50% of our total labyrinthine response, um, you really have a, a really big hit on gain there, especially for the lower frequencies. So we lose a lot of this integrated central neural integrated velocity storage response. And, and this is actually more of a permanent um, dysfunction uh, over time. Even as we recompensate for a central gain, we don't necessarily re repair that central velocity storage mechanisms. So it's actually a pretty common finding in chair that we'll often see after a compensation has occurred, normal gain, fairly normal symmetry, but you'll always see this, this low frequency uh, uh, VOR phase dysfunction. Um, and, and it's al almost always an indicator of a previous vestibular lesion uh, for your patients. Um, so why, 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 how does phase relate to V and G? This is sometimes a common question. And, and it, uh, to be honest with you, it, it doesn't. This is an advantage of chair, uh, where chair will actually give us this phase relationship that gives us insight into the velocity storage and neural integrated central mechanisms that V and G doesn't. Uh, secondly, is it, why is it a phase lead and not a phase lag? Um, it, it's not a magical kind of mysterious premonition of the eyes to move before the chair. Uh, the simple answer is that it, it's a byproduct of how we actually plot the data. Uh, we plot velocity, um, we plot eye velocity data because we plot the chair data in velocity as well. So we plot velocity against velocity, but we're always reminded that the cupula in the vestibular system responds to acceleration. Um, so if we were to plot acceleration to velocity, which would be kind of a mess. You, you probably would see a phase, you, you wouldn't see the phase lead. Um, so it's a complicated question with, with somewhat of a complicated answer, but to boil it down to, we see a phase lead and not a lag because we essentially plot, um, we plot velocity against velocity. Uh, so let's talk about velocity step testing. This is the second test that we 
commonly do in the clinic. And you can see the two different profiles that we run here. One is a fairly low stimulus profile at 60 degrees per second, where one is a fairly high velocity profile at 240 degrees per second, which is pretty fast. It's almost uh, three quarters of a turn uh, for every second that we, that we, that we spend. Um, and again, what, what you'll notice here is that the degree of nystagmus is also commensurate with, again, the stimulus of rotation. So the slow stimulus rotation produces a slow VOR, and as you saw earlier, the high stimulus produces a high degree of VOR. So let's compare and contrast the two as to why we do maybe a 60 and a 240 degree step test. Um, let's first take for example, the low velocity step test. Now, during the low velocity step test, what you've noted is that the chair abruptly accelerates to its target velocity of 60, uh, 60 degrees per second. And it stays there for about 60 seconds. It's during this acceleration period, which is about 0.3 seconds, that the chair abruptly accelerates to one direction, causing a increase in firing rate on one side, on this example to the right, and a decrease in neural firing rate on the trailing side. And then during that constant velocity stimulus, because the, again, the cupula respond to acceleration, during that 60, to 60 seconds, the cupula right themselves back up again, and the nystagmus will eventually diminish. Um, so let's take a look at, at what this what this 60 degree uh, per second velocity step test produces on a, uh, on a VOR nystagmus output. Um, so here is, here is the output that we see. And, and again, here's that acceleration point of 0.3 seconds to our target velocity of 60 degrees per second. And it's during this time where the cupular mechanics deflect the cupula in one direction. And then during the sustained velocity period, because the cupula are not enduring any more acceleration, they will begin to right themselves up again slowly. Now, this cupular mechanical period is about six seconds. Now, after six seconds, the cupula have rewrited themselves up to their resting position, but, and in essentially, not producing any more afferent drive. And if that's the case, and it's not producing an afferent drive, then what are we doing producing nystagmus over this 50 second period? If in fact the cupula are righted themselves up into their resting position after six seconds, then there should be no more afferent drive. And if there's no more afferent drive, there should be no more nystagmus, but there is. And this is known as the velocity storage mechanism. This is the mechanism we just talked about that during this six second of intense afferent drive, it's actually, we don't need six seconds of afferent drive to, to produce a VOR. So what happens is during that six seconds, the neural integrator, the velocity storage mechanism, stores all of that neural response. And then over time, even though afferent drive has essentially stopped, over the next period of maybe 30, 40, 50 seconds, the neural integrator dispels all of that stored energy drive, and you'll see that over time that nystagmus response decays and slowly ameliorates until zero. Now, that's the velocity storage mechanism that we just talked about in reference to phase, and in fact, they are related in a, in a in a very interesting way, which I would love to have time to talk about. Uh, but nevertheless, you have a cupular mechanics of six seconds and you have this velocity storage period. And this is, the, this is what we're actually asking the 60, 60 degree step test to measure. How much perpetuation of the VOR response do we have? We're actually asking in response to the peak VOR that occurred just immediately post-acceleration, you get this peak nystagmus response and almost an immediate decay of that nystagmus. At what point in time does it decay to 37% of that peak value? That's known as the VOR time decay response. And that is timed from the point of peak response to 37% decay uh, uh, 
a point of 37% decay. And that's noted here. Here's the peak response at 40, which is right around here. And then our decay took about 18 and a half seconds for it to decay one time decay. This is the time that we want to know. How much, how much is that neural integrator, how much is the velocity storage working in perpetuating that VOR response beyond? Well, to be honest with you, the normal limits of the time decay that we actually look for is about 10 seconds, which doesn't seem a whole lot because we're only asking the velocity storage mechanism really to provide a requisite three more seconds beyond that cupular mechanics. So, and that's not always easy to do for the central neural integrator uh, to produce that three seconds. Uh, obviously, in our, in our example here, it produced uh, a decay response that was much longer than that, uh, about 18 and a half seconds. Uh, but really, all we ask is that that neural integrator produce an additional three seconds beyond cupular mechanics, and we call that normal. Uh, and that assesses and gives us an idea of the health of the integrity of that neural integrated system. Um, so here's an example of that normal 60 degree step test and, and you can see that here uh, that you have this best fit line that produces the peak response and then this this marked line, this marked position here which would, be, which would have dropped that to 37% of its peak value or set another way to drop 63%. Uh, and you have that for both the acceleration, the deceleration, the acceleration to the left, and then of course the deceleration. So you actually produce four time constants in relation to the cupular mechanics that are being driven based on acceleration to the right and acceleration to the left. And these again all exceed 10 seconds, so the velocity storage mechanism is appropriately storing that neural response and expelling it slowly over time as it should. Here's an example of an abnormal decay response, and these are decay times of about eight, maybe seven, maybe six seconds that really constitute no more than just about cupular mechanics plus just a little bit. And you can see that. See the low, the slow regression, the slow decay of that nystagmus response in a healthy individual. But in an abnormal individual, one that is lacking the ability for either to produce enough afferent drive for the neural integrator to store it, or the neural integrator to actually hold on to it. But nevertheless, you have a very shortened time constant here that really doesn't exceed much more beyond cupular mechanics. Uh, so this is really indicative of either probably a peripheral pathology that's not able to provide enough afferent drive for the central system to even store, and less likely or less common, it can be a, a problem with the neural integrator itself able to store the data. So let's compare this then to high velocity step testing. And high velocity step testing in and of itself is, is is a very different, uh, very different stimulus because this is the 60 degree, and this is what we just looked at. And as we rotate to the right over that 0.3 second period, you get an excitation in the leading ear and a uh, inhibition in the in the trailing ear, but you still have a neural response that is inhibited in that trailing ear. However. In the high velocity step test, what happens now is that the acceleration occurs at a much longer period of time. And if I can just jump ahead one here, what you'll see here is that the step profile now is not 0.3 seconds, but rather four times that at 1.2 seconds. So the cupula are enduring an acceleration stimulus over four more times the other stimuli. In doing that, what happens is, is that now you, the, that trailing ear, the cupula are now enduring such a long period of acceleration. Now 1.2 may not seem like a long time, but it is for neural response rates. 1.2 seconds of acceleration is able to saturate the trailing ear and provide a nystagmus response that's reflective of just the excitatory leading ear. And that's actually what we're seeing when we perform a high velocity step test in response that now that peak nystagmus response that occurs just immediately post acceleration is a very robust VOR response at 167. Now it's never gonna be really probably 240. Again, the VOR 
is never really truly equal. It's, it's always a somewhat, somewhat deficient, but we expect that. Uh, but nevertheless, what we're doing here is we're providing not necessarily a capture of how much velocity storage is propagating that response, but more so, what is that super excited, saturated, res excitable response? What kind of nystagmus response is that producing? And we're going to compare that of right versus left. So we look at the right stimulus conditions, and we look at the left stimulus conditions, and we actually compute that much like we do a caloric um, uh, asymmetry response, and we get a VOR difference. And in this case, it's 27%. And, 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 and you feel free to use the 20% the difference or the 22% difference that you're using for calorics here to represent or, or signify an asymmetry in the response. And you can somewhat see this in the raw, raw data as well. Whenever the right word, you, you're getting a fairly robust response in the right word conditions, but in the left word conditions, you're getting a fairly weak response at only about 50, 50 degrees per second. So once we compare the right versus left, we get this symmetry that reflects laterality of the vestibular system overall. And this is all possible primarily because we're able to saturate to zero neural firing rate that trailing ear, leading the nystagmus response to only reflect that of the leading ear. So we can compare the leading right ear and then rotations leading left ear, right versus left, and we get that comparison data. Um, some common questions that often come up during um, velocity step testing, can I get ear-specific information from rotational testing? So the answer to that is that you can, um, but as long as you have to use a fairly robust target velocity, um, Bailo, in his 1979 report there, would, he did a nice study that looked at the comparison of, of high-velocity stimulus data to caloric irrigations and found fairly decent um, response and sensitivity and specificity ratings, uh, but only if you exceeded, in his report, 256 degrees uh, per second. Um, so I think you can provide some ear-specific rotational weakness data, but as long as you provide a uh, stimulus that's at least 240 degrees. Um, again, the 60-degree response will give you central function information. How well is the neural integrator working? How well is that, is that velocity storage mechanism storing that, uh, that VOR, that afferent data that's being uh, delivered from the periphery? Um, so clinicians will ask me, well, if I'm only gonna do one target velocity, which one should I do? And I, I think this largely depends on your clinical question that you're asking. Do you want laterality information because you want to avoid maybe giving this patient caloric information? I would do the 240. If you want information regarding central function, maybe to corroborate uh, some SHA data for phase data, uh, I would probably do a 60 degree um, uh, velocity, velocity step test. So I think that that answer depends on what clinical question you're asking. In my, in my experience, I generally will do both, uh, the, both the 60 and the 240. And then I get this interesting question about, well, what about a, a something in between, a 100 degree step test? And, and um, I find a 100 degree step test an interesting question uh, because it's, it's not robust enough to drive the trailing ear into saturation, so you're not really getting right versus left laterality information, and it's probably a little bit too robust to generate any meaningful data that um, that that you're gleaming about uh, velocity storage mechanisms. So, I, I'm I'm a little uh, I'm a little um, uh, unsure about the the hundred degree step test, but uh, I am uh, I am um, 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 looking at that and, and trying to find out some information regarding that. But I only stick to a very low 60 or a very high 240. So some final thoughts and common questions that I often get. Uh, for a patient with a bilateral loss, what, which, what test is best to perform, SHA, STEP, or both? Um, to be honest, I, I like both. Um, but I will tell you that uh, the, the, the SHA is probably better. 
um, because it's going to give you more information regarding vestibular reactivity or vestibular response rates at a very broad frequency range. So you can assess whether or not that bilateral vestibulopathy patient has residual vestibular response for higher frequencies. And, and we, we all know that we love to see that because rehabilitation becomes a lot more um, palliative if, 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 if certainly um, you have some residual activity to work with. Uh, is rotational testing good for screening vestibular function? Uh, so I, I believe that it is. I believe that vestibular uh, that rotational testing is, is kind of a go-to for me. Uh, it is a broad frequency response. Um, and the low frequency on, the, on rotational testing correlates very well with caloric. So if you have an abnormal caloric, you're probably going to have an abnormal low frequency 0.01 hertz response on, on vestibular testing. But to answer this question a little bit more fully, I'd, I'd probably just kind of shed some light on this article that came uh, out of Richard Lewis's lab um, by, by Presol and his colleagues, and uh, it was a machine learning algorithm that looked at vestibular testing overall and actually came to conclude that velocity step testing was probably uh, the, the most informative test that we have this within our vestibular clinic. And I'm going to urge people to kind of take a look at that article and read it. It uh, was published in 2015, and it's, and it, and it's quite good. Um, okay, so I, I know this is a very brief, fundamental, rudimentary overview. Um, but uh, I, I would encourage people to, you know, kind of um, look things up a little bit. I, I provide some oscillation abnormalities and some step abnormalities, certainly within, uh, within a textbook, and, um, and be encouraged to follow up with that. It, it's an exciting and, 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 and very uh, in, in, intu in, informative um, test clinic, that, uh, clinical test that, that we have for our patients and, and offers a lot of information that, that we can glean both peripherally and centrally from our patients. Okay, um, whoop, wrong way. Uh, so th that's all I have for you today. And um, I um, uh, encourage you to reach out to me if you have any questions that uh, maybe I sparked or maybe some pending questions that you still have. Otherwise, um, I thank everyone for their, uh, uh, for their attention here. Have a great, uh, great day.